It's been 20 years since the British gave Hong Kong back to China, and everything is awesome. Most Hong Kongers were ethnically Chinese, and like I said, the big theme at the time was reunification with the motherland. So they held a giant ceremony, did their awkward handover thing, and everyone celebrated together in weird harmony. Including a huge gala where the biggest Hong Kong stars sang a medley of popular songs, some of which had their lyrics changed to be about Hong Kong reuniting with China. So how did it all turn out? Are the 7 million residents of Hong Kong better off? Well, of course. The Chinese Communist Party kept all of its promises for six years. And then they tried to sneakily implement Article 23, a draconian anti-subversion law under the guise of national security. It was designed to allow police to burst into people's homes, search their stuff, and arrest them without a warrant just because they're suspected of subversion of the Chinese Communist Party. It also criminalized speech that instigates subversion, whatever that means. Oh, and it made things that were illegal in mainland China also illegal in Hong Kong. But Hong Kongers discovered what Article 23 was all about, and some of them marched through the streets in protest. And by some, I mean half a million people. The CCP wasn't expecting so many people to oppose Article 23, which was then withdrawn. And the CCP was forced to back down, for a while at least. The Chinese Communist Party just wouldn't give up. It kept going and going, like the Energizer Bunny, but evil. You see, an important milestone was coming up. The CCP had promised that in 2017, Hong Kongers would be able to directly elect their chief executive for the first time, instead of having someone chosen by a select pro-Beijing election committee. So in 2014, the CCP announced that yes, they would indeed keep their promise and allow Hong Kongers to elect their chief executive, as long as the pro-Beijing election committee could assist Hong Kong's democratic process by pre-selecting all the candidates that people could vote for. You know, to make sure the candidates love the country and love Hong Kong. It's like one of those diets where you can eat whatever you want as long as it's broccoli. You probably know what's coming next. A hundred thousand Hong Kongers came out to protest. Police beat them and fired tear gas. Or as they call it in China, patriotism vape. Side effects may include shedding tears of love for your country. Those protests became the umbrella movement. It was called that because Hong Kong protesters used umbrellas as shields against the patriotism vape. Chinese state media largely tried to ignore the umbrella movement, and when they couldn't, they framed it as a secret American plot to undermine China. Ultimately, the protests faded away, and the next chief executive was a pro-Beijing candidate chosen by the election committee until they realized what Hong Kongers really need is more effective brainwashing. So in 2012, they tried to force Hong Kong schools to teach what they called patriotic education. It would give children lessons on appreciating mainland China and gloss over major events like the Cultural Revolution and the Tiananmen Square crackdown. And there's nothing wrong with patriotic education, according to Chinese state media. But once again, those rebellious Hong Kongers didn't agree. And once again, thousands took to the streets to protest, including many high school students. And once again, they forced the CCP to back down. If those high schoolers had just been patriotically educated, none of this would have happened. 